they saw that it solves uh, our problems and we uh, were really impressed uh, how it handles uh, infrastructure at scale. Uh, well, I like to emphasize that we are not developers. There are guys at Intel who contributes to Kubernetes, uh, but we we actually use that software to run our infrastructure and day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, so, uh, what is Kubernetes? Uh, I think that uh, the uh, key factor is that uh, it was uh, it traces its, its lineage directly from Borg, uh, which is uh, Google's internal. Uh, container-oriented uh, cluster management system. Uh, so the guys who developed uh, Borg um, were engaged into working on Kubernetes, so all the gaps they, they uh, came uh, on and uh, the misses, they, it was addressed in Kubernetes. There's a term, uh, Google infrastructure for everyone else, that uh, CoreOS coined at uh, last CoreOS Fest. And I think it's uh, the perfect way to describe what Kubernetes means to, to, to business, developers, and operators. So, in theory, you could have uh, the same robust, uh, self-healing, efficient infrastructure that Google has, of course, with uh, some minor issues. Uh, uh, Lukas has introduced us to Kubernetes. Uh, we now know what is the origin of the project, but how does it actually work? Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, which one of you have ever used Kubernetes? Raise your hand. Okay, not many of you. So, uh, we are going to shortly describe the uh, architecture of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes, as many other cloud infrastructures, is uh, divided into planes. Um, we can call them a control plane with a Kubernetes master nodes, and a compute plane, let's call it that way, with a Kubernetes worker nodes. Of course, Kubernetes uh, master nodes perform control functions for the cluster, and the worker nodes are the ones that uh, are actually <coughs> storing the containers. But in Kubernetes, um, containers are um, wrapped into an unit that is called a pod. Pod is a basic Kubernetes uh, deployable unit, and um, it is a group of one or more, con more containers. This could be a Docker containers or uh, Rapid containers. Um, actually, Kubernetes rather manage pods uh, than the containers itself. Um, pods are uh, managed by the kubelet uh, component. Um, kubelet is a primary node agent on, installed on every Kubernetes worker node. Um, it manages pods, it creates them, it removes them, also it monitors pods um, and it uh, sends uh, information about those pods and cluster states to the control plane. Um, Kubelet is supervised by uh, control plane components, uh, however it could um, work uh, on its own in other appliances and it could be a separated manager for uh, our pods. On the other side we have a Kubeproxy component. This is a simple networking proxy. Um, it creates forwarding rules on our, on our cluster uh, in case when we want to have an external connectivity to our pods. Um, in Kubernetes, pods are given a separated network space in which they can communicate with each other. However, if you want to access your pods from the external <coughs> networks, then you have to use a Kube proxy. On the other side, we have a Kubernetes master node. Uh, we have uh, four core components in here. One of them is, is etcd. Uh, it's a key value store which contains uh, all configuration data about Kubernetes cluster. Um, Basically, all components uh, communicate to its CPU when they need some information about uh, our objects, our uh, cluster states, and etc. etc. Uh, all Kubernetes components can communicate with its CD via the API server. I assume that all of you know how does the API works. Um, in this situation, uh, we use a REST uh, protocol to forward traffic between all Kubernetes components in our cluster. It can be compared to a heart for the whole infrastructure. And if API is like a heart, then our last two components are like a brain for the cluster. These are the decision makers. Scheduler, as the name says, um, is responsible for the pod scheduling. So for example, if you want to create a pod in your cluster, then it is up to Scheduler to decide on which worker node this pod will be placed. On the other side, there is a control manager performs uh, control functions in the cluster. 
um, it watches the object states and uh, decides what to do if, uh, for example, one of our object is not in a desired state. So, for example, if you have a set of pulse on your worker nodes and one of them uh, goes down, then it is up to control and manager to decide what to do with this pod. It can be, for example, rescheduled. Re um, as you can see, um, Kubernetes architecture is not extremely difficult. It is not as simple as NMAT, of course. Um, but it is not uh, extremely difficult. Uh, here we have only six core components of Kubernetes. Um, but you have to remember this, that these are just the basics, and you can increase your cluster functionality by adding more components to it. Um, that's all about the uh, architecture of Kubernetes. Now it's time to learn something more about um, other objects and concepts. And uh, Lukas will tell you something more about it. I don't want this. It doesn't work. Yeah. Anyway, does it work? No. Okay, so don't bother. Uh, okay, so Lukas mentioned uh, bots and to understand the containers life cycle in Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, we need to talk about this. Um, so, uh, the pod is uh, an ephemeral uh, object that consists of one or more containers and uh, they share resources, uh, namespaces, they have unique IP address and I think that the most convenient factor is that uh, they can communicate on loopbacks, so you don't have to uh, have uh, necessarily knowledge about uh, uh, infrastructure, you don't have to track environments like for example Docker Compose. Uh, here we have uh, a pod that consists of uh, three, uh, three containers, uh, for example frontend which is Nginx, uh, which can refer to PHP FPM CGI server as its backend on a loopback and uh, the PHP can store its sessions in memcached. Uh, again, um, connecting to, to the back interface. Um, so, uh, we have our basic object and uh, now I would, like, I would like to talk about how to keep our applications always al alive and available in, uh, in the cluster. Uh, so Kubernetes uh, gives uh, many replication objects that could provide that. Uh, the concept is basically the same. You have the replication object, it could be deployment, replica set, uh, replication controller, uh, and you, uh, you, give it, uh, you give as a parameter, parameter number of uh, instances that will always be kept alive. You can scale up, scale down. Okay, so there are two notable approaches. One is deployments, and the second one is uh, petset. Also, I would like to uh, to mention how to reach this always available application. Uh, okay, so let's continue with deployments. Uh, so uh, the first bullet means that deployments are built on top of uh, replica sets. Uh, they incorporate replica sets uh, to uh, to spread uh, pods uh, in the cluster and to, make, uh, to keep them alive. And replica sets are uh, extension or next generation of replication controller. Uh, that's why I'm not mentioning that. So, deployment is a declarative state of uh, replicated service and that means that you, uh, you declare what you want uh, uh, and how many, uh, how many instances of application application you want to be running and then you can always uh, uh, align uh, its state to your needs so for example if you, you say you want to have a uh, newer version of application in that case uh, newer docker image uh, you uh, command uh, deployment to do that it will engage another replica set and uh, do rolling update um, in other case, you can do uh, rollbacks. Uh, everything uh, happens uh, uh, incrementally, so so there's no chance that the service won't be alive uh, in any time of the process. Um, so this is the great way to to handle uh, stateless apps or microservices. Uh, but what about stateful apps? Uh, well, up to recently. Uh, obviously, it was a bad, bad idea to, to uh, 
uh, keep uh, databases, for example, in containers. Uh, but it had changed recently. Mm. Uh, Kubernetes introduced uh, two objects. Uh, one of them is PetSet. Uh, so the difference is that PetSet uh, uh, incorporates pods that have a strong notion of identity and membership. Uh, you, you have declarative names, so, so no random uh, suffixes for container names. Uh, it implies you use stable storage. Um, and this example provides uh, the same functionality as previous one, but uh, um, you also need two features to uh, to make PetSet fully uh, fully working. The, the the things that are not mentioned here are is headless service, which works as the discovery, and uh, the volume itself. It doesn't matter what it is. It uh, it's obviously uh, a logical uh, to, to have persistent volume if you want to have uh, databases. Um, so, uh, I think that first example of usage of PetSets was Cassandra. Uh, we actually used that and it works pretty well. Um, there are another probes that you can use to, to make sure that the cluster is uh, rolling out according to your needs. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so we have our microservices, for example, Nginx, um, always up and running with a given number of replicas. Uh, we have our databases, for example, Apache Kafka, oh, that's a messaging system. Uh, uh, so we would like, to, uh, would like to enable clients and users to connect to those services. So there are two ways. The first one is uh, using service, that's the basic, uh, basic way. And uh, it, uh, it tracks endpoints, and if any of those endpoints fail, for example one pod of Nginx, uh, it will, uh, the replica controllers, replica set, will spawn another instance and service will reflect that in its redirection. But uh, recently, Ingress was introduced, um, and it's an extension of uh, service. It gives um, many incredible features like um, uh, like uh, SSL terminating uh, path and name uh, virtual hosting. Um, you can get uh, traffic fine tuning, uh, blue green deployment, and so on. So there's uh, a lot of great features. Uh, a lot of uh, ways to, to improve uh, control of your infrastructure, but the catch is you require external component, and that component is uh, Ingress Controller. It works uh, out of the box on Google Cloud, but uh, if you want that on bare metal, uh, in your own cloud, pri private, you would need to, to uh, configure Nginx. I, th I think there are three uh, Ingress Controllers uh, supported currently, <coughs> Uh, and uh, there are many projects that arise uh, that will fit perfectly in that scenario, but Nginx is, I think, the best one to use right now. Uh, okay. So, we have learned something about uh, providing uh, highly available applications in our Kubernetes cluster, but we have to remember that if you want to uh, if, if we want our applications to be in HA, then we have uh, to provide HA for our cluster first, right? What do we see in here? This is the diagram that I shown before. Uh, what do we see is that we have many Kubernetes worker nodes, and that's okay because if one of them will fail, then uh, other nodes can uh, take its functions. But we have only one Kubernetes master. We have only one node in the control plane, and that's not a, and that's not a mistake. Uh, because by default, Kubernetes architecture contains only single master, master node. Um, Kubernetes uh, does not provide uh, any dedicated solution for uh, providing HA in control plane on bare metal. And uh, Kubernetes assumes that uh, you can provide such a solution uh, on, your, uh, on your own. Can we provide such a solution uh, on our own? <coughs> of course, yes. Uh, what should we do in order to do that? 
Uh, obviously, we uh, need to add more master nodes in the control plane, but it is not uh, enough to simply add more nodes to this plane because we have to provide um, additional functions. We have to somehow synchronize those nodes because we need to have the same information on each of them. And also we need uh, a dedicate, um, we need um, additional component that would monitor those master nodes and forward traffic between our worker nodes uh, to the currently available Kubernetes master nodes. Two problems to solve. Uh, how can we handle it? Um, first problem, synchronization of master nodes. As I told you before, um, all configuration data of Kubernetes is actually stored in an etcd key value store. So, um, in order to provide Kubernetes master node synchronization, uh, we have to somehow synchronize our etcd databases. And conceptually, it would look like in the following diagram, uh, we have many master nodes. Uh, here we have three, but we can have more. Every master node has its own etcd instance, and those etcd instances uh, are somehow synchronized. Can we synchronize etcd instances? Um, luckily, the answer is yes, uh, because etcd provides us uh, built-in uh, clustering functions. Um, we can see everything on this slide. Um, it is kind of easy uh, to cluster our etcd instances. We have to uh, set a few parameters. And these are the parameters like an etcd instance name, um, a list of etcd instances in a cluster, etcd token, and etc. Et um, of course, we have to carefully plan such a cluster. Um, the rule is obvious. Uh, the, the more etcd instances in cluster, the bigger majority and fault tolerances. Um, but also, we don't want to waste our resources, right? So we have to carefully plan it. Uh, first problem solved, it was uh, kind of a piece of cake because we have uh, uh, functions provided in etcd. <coughs> but what to do with a second problem? Uh, we need an additional component that would uh, forward traffic between our compute plane and control plane. And um, an obvious, re uh, obvious choice could be a dedicated load balancer uh, device. But with such a device, we would still have a single point of failure, right? If such device uh, goes down, then our worker nodes uh, are losing communication uh, to the master plane. We have chosen the another way. Uh, in our solution, uh, in our Kubernetes clusters, we are using a uh, software load balancer, which is actually proxy. You probably all heard of it. Um, it is deployed on every worker node uh, in, form of, in form of a container. Um, HA proxy load balances traffic between our uh, single worker node and all of our Kubernetes master nodes. Um, traffic is load balanced uh, with a uh, use of a uh, run-driven load balancing algorithm, and uh, of course, kubelet and kubeproxy components are now not di directly connecting to the API server, but are connecting to the HA proxy instead. Uh, here are some pieces of uh, config. Uh, we can see everything. Um, HA proxy um, basically is divided into two sections. Uh, first of them is a front end uh, in which we specify the, um, the IP address, which is localhost in this example, and the port on which a, uh, HA proxy listens. And we also specify a backend uh, for this front end. So, in this example, um, if any API call goes to the localhost and port 8080, then it will be forwarded to, to our backend. And in our backend, uh, we have uh, many, many parameters. Uh, there are only uh, some of them. Uh, but uh, the most important ones are the balancing algorithm, which is run robin in our example, and the list of API <coughs> servers, which we see in this picture. Um, now we only have to configure kubelet and kubeproxy. Um, we have to change uh, one flag on each of them. Uh, we have to change an API server IP address. Um, before, kubelet uh, was directly connecting to an IPA server on one of our master nodes, but now uh, we have to change it to localhost and port 8080, uh, on which HA proxy is listening. The same we have to do with our proxy. So, um, with such configuration, we have provided an HA solution for our, for our control plane. Uh, our master nodes are now in HA. Um, 
we have deployed many QMS clusters. So, uh, we use uh, this solution and it works pretty well for us. Uh, so I encourage you to use the same way. Uh, eventually you can uh, choose uh, your own tools like other low bounds software. At this point, you may think that there is nothing more that we can do for providing uh, high availability in Kubernetes, but there is still a higher level uh, on which we can touch this subject. Uh, Ukash will tell you something more about it. Um, okay, so we covered uh, we covered HA for applications. Uh, we are ensured that applications will always be up and running. Uh, same with uh, reaching those applications, we have HA for, for our uh, control plane, but there's another level. So uh, what if our cluster fails, there's a power outage or, or network outage or DDoS attack strikes uh, the whole data center? It's something i actually uh, survived a few times. Uh, so Kubernetes uh, obviously has answered for that uh, and it's uh, through federation. Um, it, uh, it, it seems to be complicated, but the implementation is very simple. Um, uh, on one of the clusters, you, you install two components. Uh, one is Federated API, and the second one is uh, Federation Control Manager. Uh, you interact with uh, one API, and, it, uh, uh, and through Federation Control Manager, uh, it uh, schedules appropriate uh, uh, applications or services throughout all the clusters. Uh, so, implementation is very easy. Uh, uh, it works uh, fairly well, but there are two catches. Uh, first one is that uh, not all objects are federated, so uh, you can uh, spawn uh, replica sets, so basically you can spawn pods in every cluster, taking obviously into account its capacity and capabilities, uh, but there are no uh, currently a possibility to use, for example, Chrome-like jobs uh, in federated scenario. And the most important uh, drawback is that here's your single point of failure. Uh, but, uh, uh, if you lose your, f let's say, federation uh, control manager, uh, you can interact with all the clusters as usual. Uh, it's just a proxy for interacting with uh, all the clusters. There's no inside logic, uh, so uh, clusters are independent of that. Uh, okay, um, so what are the conclusions? Uh, well, this slide I wrote uh, at the beginning of our preparation. Uh, so I watched many, many, too many Apple keynotes, and uh, Lukas said that I will have to back this story. So uh, we approached Kubernetes with great enthusiasm, and um, well, uh, the more we work with it, we are more more convinced that it really can solve our problems, uh, even if not our all. Um, Solutions are provided out of the box. Uh, as we demonstrated, we really can, through trivial workarounds, uh, reach the point where the, the, the cluster is fully functional and, and we really uh, can have peace of mind. Um, I think that uh, 1.2 release is around the corner. Uh, it should be released in December. And uh, there are many features that will probably bring a lot of functionality and all the gaps uh, I, I talked about and I missed will probably address there. Um, uh, I really do think that uh, Kubernetes uh, is, uh, is really robust piece of so software and you really can have the self-healing infrastructure. If only developers could, could write the cloud native applications, uh, you can forget about pager duty and, and on-call rotation. Uh, so, uh, how to carry on? Um, if you've never used Kubernetes before, uh, there are two great ways. One is Minikube. I think that everyone to try to catch up with Docker and uh, provide mini something. Uh, you can install it on your laptop or there's interactive tutorial. I never use that uh, because uh, working at Intel means that we have a bonus of hardware. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
Well, the things we mentioned are a tip of the iceberg. So uh, the documentation is very robust. Of course, Tom said that uh, some things are explained for Google Cloud Platform specifically. Uh, but the community is really growing. There's a huge hype on Kubernetes. So if you have any kind of problem, probably there's a solution for that. Uh, I really encourage you to, to look at six, there's, uh, which are special interest groups. There are six for everything. And uh, probably we can't find uh, time to, to participate in any all of them. Uh, there are uh, weekly uh, video conferences when everyone can participate. There are Slack channels and uh, Google gr groups. And uh, um, well, maybe the most important thing that uh, we usually operate to a CLI client, but from developer's perspective. Um, the, the API is the most important factor because um, uh, it's uh, really flexible and you can easily in incorporate it with your current infrastructure. Well, so I think that's all from us. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, one question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have actually first a comment or an explanation and then a question. Uh, so just FYI, the PET set has been renamed Stateful Set and it will be released in 1.5 as you said. Like the PET set was more like a code name and we couldn't, have, uh, couldn't come up with anything uh, better earlier. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it wasn't clear from the presentation if you lose a master then your apps will keep running. Uh, it's just that you will not be able yeah. to modify anything. Uh, uh, and you will be able to modify everything. If your master ah, dies, sorry. then a single you master will, scenario. Yes. yes, in a single master scenario, if your master dies, the application will keep running, but you will not be able to, to yeah. change anything. Yeah. Uh, and my question: <laughs> You had an awesome cross out as which is nice. So, what, in your opinion? Uh, you had in your last slide, you had the screens, it's awesome, crossed out, nice. Uh, so what, yeah. would be, what would be the, if you like, were to name three things or one thing that would make it awesome or at least closer to awesome? Uh, what would it be? Okay, the thing, the gaps uh, that we came across uh, are the hand, automatic handling of uh, IP assignment. Uh, so it works on, uh, or it works on public cloud. Uh, the federation also have uh, has a lot of gaps. Uh, one of them is uh, services again, so the same problem. Uh, it um, in perfect scenario uh, it works uh, like that. Uh, you have um, you schedule a service, you spawn a service in every cluster, then you have uh, then you. Uh, have external IP which is re registered in uh, external DNS provider, for example, AWS uh, Route 53 or uh, Google DNS or uh, Core DNS in next release. And then uh, DNS provider should support uh, DNS geo geolocation. So the client will always have uh, resolved the nearest IP. Uh, so again, it's not out of the box solution. I've got a question. Uh, from the uh, one of the slides, you showed that you are using federation across the regions. Don't you think that this is an overkill? For example, in AWS, you have, a, for example, each region uh, managed by its own. So maybe the federation should be kept in between data centers. Then you can uh, not use master in multi master configuration. Uh, once again, you would like to keep one master node uh, that would control all the clusters. No. Uh, yeah, the mom, the yeah, my, yeah, my, my idea like, is... Well, maybe I didn't explain it properly, but uh, yes, we do have uh, multiple clusters in different data centers. And you would like to expose the API for the end user or developer to schedule the application uh, simultaneously in all the clusters. So... Maybe I'm yes, but, but, stand, but still, you are using multi masters just to control the masters. Yes? Or no? Uh, the, my, my idea is that uh, trying like to, to use the single 
Uh, you mean that we use multi-master in a federation plane? Or? Yes. No. Uh, as for a fact, the federation is a, a subject of tests in our um, uh, division, and we only testing it right now. We don't use uh, multi-master in federation plane. We don't see a um, reason uh, by now uh, for using them. But of course, uh, we can use multi-master uh, in every data center that we use. Another question, because uh, for example, uh, in AWS you have this uh, uh, availability zones and they are not using high availability within the zone. That's why they're using uh, separate data centers just for that. For example, one data center goes down, you don't have to care about the high availability for that. So you mean that the multi-master configuration is not necessary, right? Yes, exactly. But, um if uh, one of our, our master nodes in one data center will fail, why, sh why should we choose to the another data center if the whole infrastructure is uh, still working, can be still working if we deployed uh, HA for it? Um, in my opinion, I don't see a reason to switch between data centers because uh, we can still have a ready and working cluster in one of them. Yes, but you are in just uh, introducing the huge complexity. But this is something different for on-prem, right? I mean, in the sense like if you're running on-prem, you don't have this uh, luxury of just switching from one zone to another. You just have a set exactly. of hardware and you need to manage this somehow. So then I chase like a must. I would say. Exactly. Another thing is ro uh, rolling upgrades. If you have multi-master uh, setup, then you can do rolling upgrades for the master cluster. Exactly. Again. Another question. <laughs> 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 I will take that bit. Yeah, why not? Why not virtual IP instead of uh, HA proxy? But because it's not working. Uh, you, uh, there is a solution, but again, it's um, it's another piece in the puzzle. Um, I would like to see um, something that works out of the box. HA proxy uh, would have to somehow, that's one of the implementations actually. You have the HA proxy server that uh, uh, is populated through ConfD, uh, through, uh, through the configuration at CD, and again and again it, it builds a lot of complexity that you would like to get rid of. Uh, so, uh, uh, we sometimes try things on public cloud and then try to replace it on private cloud and um, the yeah, no. people are switching probably to public cloud because it's so easy. I think that, that sometimes Ape could build Kubernetes on Google. So uh, uh, yes, we would like to see it simpler, the easy of use. The last question. <laughs> Uh, in your configuration of HA proxy, do you use dynamic IPs or just uh, statically assigned uh, from the pool? You're asking about HA proxy that we use for uh, for uh, masters. Yeah, uh, in general for masters. For example, you can set up the HA proxy with dynamic backend. No, we are using static IPs and uh, preferably SSL. So we okay. would like to avoid the plain traffic. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say something more about the stable storage you mentioned in a uh, pet set example? Is it something uh, provided by Kubernetes? Uh, there are many types, uh, but in this case uh, we use uh, the type persistent volume and persistent volume claims. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's on uh, Ceph. Uh, or uh, Google uh, persistent uh, disk, uh, it actually doesn't matter. Because I mentioned that because I think you can use pet sets without, uh, without uh, the stable storage, uh, but it's pointless somehow. There are many storage providers in Kubernetes for uh, even NFS, uh, but it's just logical implication of using pet sets. Okay, but uh, you need to set up uh, a persistent storage uh, by your own, like it's Ceph or something like that on, on the You server. can use your local disks, for example. Okay, but <laughs> not so stable if one node goes down. 
Well, but that's um, uh, that's the point where we are all going to to have this self infrastructure. For example, with Cassandra uh, in pe Cassandra zero in Petset fail, the Cassandra six will be spawned uh, and the appropriate uh, disk will be scheduled, and the, uh, you will see note to that keys key spaces are are migrating. Yeah, but it, this, this will be done by Cassandra itself, yeah, not yeah. the storage, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, are okay, we staying for the after party? Tonight? Yeah, yeah we do. Okay, so <laughs> let's leave the rest good. of the questions to the after party. Yeah, I can see some of your uh, questions. <laughs> Another set of questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh,